You're tuning in to the Weirdest Web the Podcast. Weirdest Web Podcast. What time is it? The Weirdest Web. It's time. So weird. Good morning, weirdlings. Welcome to the fourth thread of the Weirdest Web Podcast a podcast celebrating artists of all kinds from all around the globe. This podcast is dedicated to showcasing hidden artistic gems while highlighting the magical world of artistic expression as a channel of spirituality and mysticism. I'm your weird host and even weirder resident high priestess, Caitlin Mora Walzer. I myself am an artist, a musician, a dancer, a writer, an animal lover, and a general weirdo. Today is Saturday, March 18th of 2023. I know it's been a couple of weeks since I put out a podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for your patience. I've been um, working pretty hard in my class and it's taking up a lot of my time. So I'm going to be getting these out sort of irregularly until, um, until May when my class is over and then I can resume my tri-weekly postings. So um, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm very excited today to welcome our fourth guest to the show, Mr. Jared Gordon. Um, we had a bit of guest shuffling. Miss Kali will be on next week. Um, she's still readjusting to being back in the States. So today we have the pleasure and the treat of having Mr. Jared Gordon on. And I'm so excited because I actually didn't think I was going to be able to catch him between everything he's been up to. So it's just like an absolute treat to have him on. And I can't wait to share that interview with you guys. Um, first off, um, I would like to spin the first half of our thread. We're coming up on a lovely time of year, starting with the spring equinox, which is coming up on March 21st. I debated whether or not to cover that this week or next week, but since the episodes are going to be pretty much back to back, we'll delve into that in the episode coming up um, in a few days with Miss Kelly. Um, and that will mark the official time, the official, it's the official mark of spring, the official beginning of springtime in the Northern Hemisphere of the United States. Um, and there are some really amazing festivals in March, and I haven't really covered them like I did in February, so we're going to cover those today. Not all of them have to do with the equinox, um, but some of them do. <laughs> so we're going to dive deep into the spring equinox in a few days, um, likely in a likely in the beginning of the next podcast. So today marks roughly six weeks also since I launched the Weirdest Web Podcast series, and I want to officially thank my subscribers and my listeners for tuning in. You can now find me on Spotify as well, which I'm very excited to announce as of this morning. Um, and everyone has just said so many kind and beautiful things. I've been getting so much beautiful feedback, and I really appreciate that. This podcast was originally set up to help expose some brilliant artists and also to educate people about um, mysticism, magic, the ethereal realms, um, art around the world, and just give some exposure to people's experiences. And it looks like it's starting to actually be a thing. So I feel really excited by that. Um, before I go any further, I also want to wish a heartfelt congratulations to my friends from Egypt, Eliana and Ahmed, who are now Mr. and Mrs. Um, Riviero Janati. And I hope I didn't butcher your last name too much, you guys. Um, Ahmed has been a huge sounding board for my podcast, and he's offered a lot of constructive criticism and helpful feedback, and his contributions are so appreciated. And I'm hoping I can maybe get him to come on as a guest at some point to share his marvelous photography and his adventures as a tour guide in the Middle East. So Ahmed, hint, 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 huge hint. Um, okay, moving on to our global festival rundown of the month of March. Uh, March 3rd in Bali, we had Nayabi Day, which was the day of silence. It's a three-day Indonesian New Year celebration which concludes on Nayapi, and it begins with a multitude of parades that last for a few days beforehand, and that includes these giant paper mache demons. I actually watched a parade online. It was really cool, um, and they're like giants and demons and these other creatures, and the festival ends with a 24-hour period of silence and self-reflection from 6 a.m. 
uh, to sundown on March 3rd. Or, I'm sorry, 6 a.m. on March 3rd to 6 a.m. on March 4th. So everything basically stops dead. Electricity, cars, flights, shops. And it is a day to reflect. And some people choose to fast during this time, but not everybody. It's a very interesting holiday. Um, on March 4th in Mexico, we have the Night of the Witches or Noche de Brujas. And the annual weekend of witchcraft, magic and sorcery, it's held in uh, Catamaco, Mexico, which is just pretty cool. I mean, there and there are a lot of practitioners. My understanding is there's a lot of practitioners that gather in attendance for this festival. Um, and it just seems like a very interesting thing. I might put that on my bucket list at some point. On March 15th through 19th, we have La Falla in um, Valencia, with which celebrates the patron saint of carpenters, otherwise known as St. Joseph. This festival dates back to the medieval times, and it's highlighted by um, the creation of these paper mache puppets called ninots, or ninots, I'm not sure how they pronounce it. Um, and they're dolls that are sort of um, in the image of popular people or well-known people. And as soon as midnight hits, all of the ninots are set on fire, except for the winner, which is it goes straight to the um, the unique La Falla, which means the Fires Museum, which is dedicated for these specific dolls that win every year, these paper mache um, puppets. It's a very interesting festival there. March 16th through 18th, we have Purim in Tel Aviv. It's a huge street party. Now, Purim is actually, so I'm, I'm half Jewish, um, and growing up, my family celebrated um, all the Catholic holidays or Christian holidays. We also cele celebrated a lot of the Jewish holidays. However, we never celebrated Purim growing up. I did not experience Purim until I was actually in my priestess training um, some years later. But it's this really amazing sort of decadent holiday in the Jewish tradition that celebrates Queen Esther overturning um, the Hammam's plan to, to slaughter the Persian Jews. And this is something that Jews around the world celebrate and it's a grand, it's like a grand time. It's usually fairly debaucherous and fun. Um, and honestly, probably the only Jewish holiday aside from Hanukkah that is dedicated to pure enjoyment. Um, and I like Hanukkah too, but I grew up, you know, my parents are really great about exposing us to both Jewish and Catholic holidays. And then of course I became pagan shortly thereafter at the age of 11. So, um, reclaiming my rightful role as the family witch. So now we celebrate everything, or I celebrate everything. Um, and my dad is now basically Buddhist. But I feel like the thing that cracks me up about most Jewish holidays is that they center around who and who isn't getting slaughtered. And so Purim is like the most fun of all of those. <laughs> um, the most notable location for this festival is in Tel Aviv, where my big sister Ariella worked on a kibbutz for about seven years. Um, so Tel Aviv goes balls out with this festival and they dress in costumes and they party and have this, you know, beautiful, delicious food everywhere and art. Um, and they hold street festivals and parades and they have just this really cool time. And they also open up donations for those in need at this time. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my nephews, both of them. One of them is in Israel right now training uh, with the Israeli army, following in his grandpa's footsteps, my dad. And I hope that he gets to attend this while he is in Israel. Um, so much love to both of my nephews, Mikhail and Yoab, and to my beautiful niece, Zoe, and of course, to my beautiful sister, Ariella. Um, so March 17th through 18th, we have Holi in India and Nepal. This is a springtime Hindu celebration of love. And like all festivals in India, it's drenched in beautiful, bright colors, um, which I love. I feel like we lack color here in the U.S. when it comes to really anything. Um, and the evening of Holika Dahan is celebrated by burning pyres to symbolize the god Vishnu's defeat over the demoness uh, Holika and the triumph of good over evil. And the people will decorate themselves in these brightly colored powders and sort of take to the streets to celebrate and dance and, and party. So it sounds like a lot of fun. Again, another thing on my bucket list. Um, March 18th, we have Stark Birzit in Munich, which is sort of the opposite of, it's the opposite on the wheel of Oktoberfest. So, um, it's another beer festival, <laughs> um, but this is otherwise known as the Strong Beer Festival. So this is the springtime brews. It's 
the beginning of the year festival, so it's a little bit more chill than the famous autumn October beer fest, but it's also very traditional with everybody partaking in traditional dress and food and celebrating the stronger beers. You know, I think Germany is just kind of drunk a lot of the time, um, <laughs> which would explain a lot, which is no shade. I'm just observing. Um, probably because they have really good beer. Anyway, Spring Equinox in Chichen Itza in Mexico is also going to be celebrated on the 21st, which is the Equinox. Um, the Mayan ruins there attract a huge crowd pretty much annually. And you can watch the the luminous spectacle of one period of, um, of, of the, sorry, not period, the pyramid, guys. It's early in the morning for me. Um, so you can watch the light, the interplay of the light on the pyramids. And there's a myth around the snake god, um, a deity. And it starts in the late afternoon. And it just kind of comes in with the, in the interplay of light and shadows create this illusion of a snake sort of slithering down. Um, the staircase of the Mayan ruins. So this kind of celebrates what is believed to be the snake deity's return to earth. So that's that. On March 24th to May 15th, we have also the opening of the Kuchenhof Gardens in Amsterdam. So this is a 79 acre seasonal flower burst that's just outside of Amsterdam and it houses roughly 7 million tulips, daffodils and hyacinths and a few other things. And my understanding is that the air smells entirely of flowers. This is according to people that I've known that have been there. Um, definitely another bucket list item. And speaking of flowers, the cherry blossom festival in Kyoto, Japan um, this globally acknowledged and like loved favorite of Japan is is about to start. They don't always know exactly when the you know first little pops of pink on the cherry blossoms will happen, but this year they're thinking it's probably around March 25th. Um, it generally lasts a little bit the way through mid-April. Cherry blossoms are kind of like magnolias like that, where you get this lovely little two-week period of amazingness, and then they're just gone forever for the rest of the year. Um, and that concludes our festivals for March. In our lunacy corner, talking about the moon phases, we're currently in a waning crescent moon, and we'll be doing um, a bigger little, a bigger sort of post on this because on the equinox, it will also have a new moon, which is we basically always have a new moon on the equinox, but it's worth talking about this time. Um, so that's again coming up on the 21st. I'm very much going to try to put out more content about this um because we did a little bit about the full moon last time i'd like to delve in a little bit about the new moon this time so our waning crescent moon today is in the sign of capricorn which is a sign that sort of appreciates practicality and precision and groundedness right it's not a it's not a dreamy sign it's definitely a good time for um you know before the new moon hits to contemplate practical changes that are sort of like no nonsense type th type of things and this isn't like a this is not, again, like an artsy, fartsy kind of sign. This is like the sign of money and groundedness and home and schedules. And like, that's Capricorn, very earthy, very grounded. Okay. And we have next up our global energetic reading. So you guys, I paused this really quickly to pull the cards so you didn't have to sit through, you know, the time it takes to, for me to flip and ground and all that stuff. Um, and pulling out the cards. So it's an interesting reading today. We have something very aligned with springtime, but also sort of what we're coming out of right now. Um, this is talking about, again, I think we had a similar reading a, like a month or so ago where we were talking about not following the siren call, right? Not following the fake, um, you know, the fake promises and the fake allure, this is kind of like being able to open up our own intuitions and being able to see through that and no longer following down uh, the primrose path, right? So um, gardening, getting our hands into the earth this season is going to be very important for all of us. It is time to reconnect. With the earth, it is also time to utilize uh, water and the flow of water with our um, wishes, desires, hopes, and also the idea of cleansing, which is very much a springtime thing, right? Um, we're cleansing, we're preparing the way for summer. Um, 
So cleansing diets, cleansing baths, um, bath salts, et cetera. If you would not, I don't mean like the crazy bath salts that people are doing on the street and turning into living zombies. I mean, actual, like, <laughs> like magical bath salts, the energetic properties of, of dead sea salt and rosemary, things like that, that are cleansing us out. This is also a season that's going to require quite a bit of shape shifting. And I'm not talking about, you have to, you have to think of things in metaphors, right guys? Like people, People that deliberately block this stuff out will be like, oh, you mean like true blood, how they're shapeshifters? No, I don't mean that. I mean, if you can change yourself into a horse or a dog, goddess bless, like I'm jealous, but that's not what I'm talking about. What we're talking about here is the ability to adapt, okay? Um, from, a, from a very practical standpoint, shapeshifting can be seen as an adaptation and the ability to sort of bend, mold, shift, and change with the environment in order to direct the flow of energy. So if you've been tuning into my Weirdest Grimoire and my Ask a Priestess podcast threads, you will be a little more tuned into what this means. Um, so we're, we're talking about being able to shift also, right? Like, and maybe that means you're taking, um, you're taking desires of your heart, things that have been long standing, and those things might need to take a different shape, right? We're going to have to let some things go um, to allow the different shapes to come in, to allow the, the transformations of certain things that need to go from one phase to another to come in, whatever that phase looks like. We are coming out of a tremendous period of darkness, and I, um, according to the cards, <laughs> I love just being able to say it's the cards, not me. Um, we're going to be in this period of darkness for a little bit longer, and it is going to require a massive amount of collective agreement to adapt, mold, bend, and change things to our will so that the future of our global humanity, our society, our brother and sisterhood, um, et cetera, um, have have some pathways open in order to grow and flourish and not be stomped out is basically what's going on. So that's going to require a great deal of energetic um, crafting on behalf of everybody who's inclined to do so. And those that are not inclined to do so probably will not be coming, you know, through that gateway, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast. Um, moving through the season here and through this time, we also have, the idea of sacrifice coming up and what does it mean to sacrifice and sacrifice? Um, I'm again, I'm not talking about any kind of animal sacrifice. That's a hard no. Um, there are some, some people that do that in the world. And quite frankly, you know, just a quick recap, the traditional idea of that is to keep a balance between life and death, but there is way too much death happening on the planet. So there's literally no reason to be engaging in that practice right now for any reason. Um, especially since humans make up 95% of the mammalian population on the planet and everything else is dying out. So no, there, there is no murdering of creatures, innocent creatures. Okay. Um, but the idea of sacrifice here is that we are giving up something for the greater good that, that we care about, perhaps that we love very deeply or cherish in order to bring in something even greater that's going to uh, generate sort of an exponential amount of healing, right? So this might be like, maybe you're giving up, um, maybe you're giving up one, in, like one dearly held wish in order to bring in a greater capacity to hold something that's even more beneficial, right? Um, and we all have those things, right? Personal goals and dreams that perhaps we need to sacrifice and give up because it is something that we love. Pure sacrifice. Sacrifice can only be something that you love. It can't be something that you're kind of curmudgeonly giving, right? Otherwise, it's not really a sacrifice. Um, but when you willingly place something you desire, love, cherish on the altar of life for the pure sake of bringing in something deeper and greater, that never goes unrewarded or unanswered. It just doesn't. And I know that never is an absolute and we don't really do absolutes on this show, but I personally have never had a circumstance where um, I've done something to that effect and it hasn't been answered in my personal life. 
this is also going to require people using their voices, all right? Whether that's to sing or to speak out, it's a time to speak. It is a time to stand your ground. It is a time to get really, really deeply connected with the earth um, and understanding the rhythmic practices of the earth and understanding the rhythmic patterns. Even if you're not a spiritual person, even if you don't believe, again, tune in to my Weirdest Grimoire podcast. Connect yourself to the energy of all the living things on the earth. It is time to do that. If you've been shut off, if you've been closed up, as many of us have over the last three years, it's time to get your feet on the ground. It's time to get outside into the air. It's time to greet the spring of the earth and your life as well. Um, and spring in the Northern Hemisphere again. In our Southern Hemisphere, our Southern Hemisphere brothers and sisters are celebrating the incoming of fall, okay, autumn, with the fall equinox coming up on their side. But this is what we're talking about for the energetic global reading. It's just a time where we need to get our hands into the earth. We need to start reacquainting ourselves with the rhythms and the, the biorhythms of ourselves with the planet and everything around us. And we need to start adapting our own energy to that rather than going against because it's just really time to open those channels back up so that we can build pathways into whatever era humanity is stepping into our, our renaissance right that's that's here so that is our global energetic reading so now we're going to get into a holiday that i deliberately skipped over because it deserves a little more attention and it is saint patrick's day i'm sure you guys were like wait a minute she skipped over the 17th what happened well this is what happened there's more to talk about than i could fit into that lineup of holidays so let's talk about saint patty's day for a moment I'm certainly not the only one who's espoused this information, but I would be remiss in my self-assumed duties as resident witch and priestess and podcaster if I did not make sure that this information was included in our lineup. So firstly, according to numerous sources, St. Patrick is venerated all over the world as a patron saint. Okay, He's heavily celebrated not only in Ireland, but also um, in Australia, Nigeria, and Montserrat, and also throughout some of uh, European Spanish culture as well. So in a nutshell, the alleged story is that in 426 AD, St. Patrick, whose original name was Sakot, as a child, his name was Sakot, he was kidnapped and uh, brought to Ireland as a slave by Pictish and Irish raiders who nabbed him out of his bed in the middle of the night. Now, Sakot grew up on the west coast of Great Britain, and they have been debating whether or not it's sort of like Wales or Scotland, but they're settling on Wales, it seems like, as the general agreed upon location, um, but somewhere off the west coast of Great Britain. And that was a part of the Roman Empire at the time, so keep that in mind as we go on, right? St. Patrick's original name, again, was Sakot, and the alleged story was that he was brought to Ireland as a slave. Now, Sakat's father was a Christian deacon and a minor Roman official and a tax collector. Keep that in mind as well. And his grandfather was a priest in the Roman Empire. And the story is very interesting here because allegedly he was, you know, taken to Ireland, forced to live in the wilds, ripped away from his home, no food, no shelter for six years, where he minded dogs and livestock. He was also kept in total isolation apart from the animal life, and due to this, he developed a very strong spiritual life and became something of a mystic at a very young age. So he would pray a hundred times a day and a hundred times at night. Now, sidebar, I'm pretty sure that somebody checked on him because of the value of livestock in the Celtic culture was extremely high. So they weren't gonna leave, um, they weren't gonna leave a kid to just like watch watch everybody and just. Uh, come what may. I'm sure that he had people, minders that came. So, but we have no real proof of that. So according to the story, he was able to escape his enslavement. And he recounts in writing that he had a dream where an angel came down to him with a vision of a ship that was leaving to go back home to Great Britain and instructions of how to board the ship undetected so he could get back to his family. So apparently he walked about 200 miles through the peat bogs of Ireland to get to the ship. And it was initially, he was initially denied passage until the captain heard that raiders had kidnapped him or after him. And then he was allowed on board and he eventually arrived back in Great Britain, Great, woof, sorry, you guys, Great Britain. And his family was overjoyed to see him, of course. Now, 
that's the initial long and long accepted story. There is a competing theory by a scholar from Cambridge named Roy Fletchner. And I'm going to throw this in the mix because it's worth discussing because it is suddenly on the table. Um, he has different assertions and there's a lot of dissent in the ranks about this, although most people do not side with his theory, but it's very interesting to bring up and worth discussing. So Fletchner basically says that the story of Sakat being kidnapped and brought over to Ireland was something that Sakat made up himself in letters he was writing regarding his capture and enslavement, because that's how he wanted to be remembered as this like person who had struggled and come into holiness, right? And that he actually fled to Ireland because he didn't want to become a tax collector like his father. So again, what's important here is that Great Britain was very much under the rule of the Roman Empire because during this time, the Roman Empire was kind of crumbling and um, tax collecting became a really dangerous job. So and also um, at this time, for some reason, this is a fact that doesn't go highlighted, but professions uh it goes unhighlighted a lot of the time is what i meant to say but professions in in the roman empire were mandated to be hereditary so basically they were handed down from father to son so sakat would have been absolutely obligated to become a tax collector and a lot of the offspring of tax collecting families at the time were actually fleeing the roman empire and the places that were under the rule of the roman empire um to seek safety and and escape their fates as tax collectors. And the reason was because um, it was really difficult. It was becoming increasingly difficult to collect taxes that were asked for by the state. And as the result, you know, resulting punishments were severe from the state, even ending in death. Um, but it wasn't just there. It was because the actual very act of attempting to collect taxes from people who couldn't or wouldn't pay um, also resulted in, you know, a number of terrible things. So, um, it is very possible that Sakat pur purposely fled to Ireland to escape. However, we also know that he was factually snatched out of his bed by an Irish raiding party in the middle of the night and kidnapped. And there are witnesses to that. Like his family also had their writings about that on both sides, right? So he didn't just make it up. Um, the other thing, is, the other thing that's curious though is that he did somehow acquire paper during the time that he was held captive, apparently alone, isolated, and with nothing but, but you know, himself and the sky and the Lord, I guess. Um, but somehow he had paper and an inkwell um, and some place to write. So that's that's something to, to sort of notate. And we don't know. There's a ton of missing details in there, right? But he did somehow manage to write the account of what he was going through as he was going through it. Okay. Um, the other thing is that Sakat's family was very wealthy. They were initially very wealthy um, Roman officials. So it totally tracks that he could have escaped over to Ireland to escape that fate. Um, except that <laughs> while he was in Ireland, um, it would have been 16-year-old Sakat against these hordes of Celtic armies who were very violent and very organized. So it doesn't seem very likely. Um, Fletchner also goes on to say that it would have been very difficult for Sakat to escape as a slave undetected and untracked, and he would have been severely punished um, on the ship, you know, taking him back to Great Britain. But the caveat, of course, being that Ireland, Ireland itself was not under the rule of the Roman empirical um, statutes. And so if he had escaped from Ireland and returned to Britain, nobody would have had any reason to suspect he was an escaped slave of Ireland, right? Um, it would have been different if it was the other way around. So that's kind of out. Um, he also supposes that Sakat actually went to Ireland to engage in the Celtic Roman slave trade and that he was um, actually using slaves, Celtic slaves, to pay for his boarding and his um, life back in Britain. Once he got there, he sold off the Irish slaves that he stole. However, again, unlikely because it would have been 16 year old Sakat. Um, so I guess 21 year old Sakat against, you know, hordes of very well organized uh, Irish armies. So the likelihood of him sort of absconding with some, some of them and heading back to, to Great Britain is not likely unless there was, 
um, you know, a traitor amongst the mix that was will, willingly helping him do that. But I, I just highly doubt it. Something doesn't really feel super right about that. So once he returned to Great Britain, um, he was there for a while and he, he took up the mantle as priest and he realized in he felt called back to Ireland to bring you know, the word of the Lord to the pagan and, um, you know, at the time considered feral tribal people of the Celtic Isles. So it's also worth noting at this time, the church itself was established in Ireland somewhat, but it, it was not uh, independent of the Roman Empire. So Ireland was not under the Roman Empire, but the church that was in Ireland and established was under the Roman rule. Um, under the jurisdiction of Rome. So Sakat returned to Ireland after taking the mantle of, of priest. And Mr. Fletchner, our scholar from Cambridge, argues that nobody in their right mind who had been kidnapped would willingly return to the land where they had, were held captive and would purposely return there. So sure, sure, that's likely true. However, we are not entirely sure what happened to him when he was in Ireland. Um you know, he he also very clearly was not in his right mind for quite a time, you know, and people go through these like layers of things when they're under stress and trauma and duress. So so unless you consider the fact that he very clearly wasn't in his right mind, like we we know that at least one other human had to have been keeping some sort of watch over him. Right. And we also don't know what the nature of that relationship. And we also know that Stockholm syndrome is a thing now. Right. So we don't know if he was abused. We don't know if he made friends with the person. We don't know if it was a woman that he may have fallen in love with, but somebody was was going out to regulate and make sure that he was actually doing what he was supposed to do and keeping track of the livestock. Um, they weren't just going to leave their most precious commodity to fate, right? Under the under the um, the watch of a of a teenager, like that's not a logical thing. Somebody was going out there to help him, or at least at the very least admonish him for not doing it right, right? So also. Um, the other piece of that is if 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 Ireland was in, indeed the land where uh, Sakat St. Patrick was sort of pushed into this state of spiritual gnosis, which we've talked about in some other episodes, where he was having what he perceived to be a direct communication with the divine, um, he may have felt compelled to return for that reason. And, you know, I obviously personally, I don't doubt that he had uh, a a total connection with the divine because um, magic and connection to divinity is typically born out of pain and pressure um, and not out of like happy, happy relaxedness. Right. And he had all kinds of pain and pressure that would press him into that state. So what happened here is kind of hit or miss for people. Right. Um, so we know that um, we know that, that trauma that comes with certain things, right? And uh, what happens after trauma can result in certain other things, right? Okay, so without saying too much, because again, I'm not a licensed therapist, but I will go ahead and say that, um, you know, he was ripped away from his family at a pivotal age of development. He was forced into what we can conclude is likely a violent existence, um, at the very least a lonely one. But the Picts and the Irish were very intense people. And we know from um, the writings that he was subjected to um, extreme cold, extreme conditions, often barefoot, um, trying to run around herds of, of cattle and sheep. And Ireland is actually an extremely cold place to be. Okay. And we also know that, you know, because of just the way of life, um, there that he was likely subjected to some pretty intense violence upon his person, or at least at the very least witnessing it as well. And that can just be devastating to a developing mind. Um, and then he became very reliant on his faith and his connection to the divine. And while this is totally understandable and basically a way for him to emotionally survive, we can kind of look at this in a couple of different ways, right? Like from a spiritual standpoint, again, this is kind of a representation about how magic and being in touch with the divine is often born through extreme pain and darkness. From a psychological standpoint, um, which didn't exist as an area of study during that time, right? Not till you know centuries later. It's basically his, he was like he had the perfect recipe going for like some kind of disorder or issue like schizophrenia, right? And we also see this kind of patterning in figures like Joan of Arc, where they have a sudden connection to the divine and they're called by God, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying they're not, okay? 
we can possibly see this as like a dissociation from from trauma, right? Um, from a traumatic situation by going into spiritualism. And we still see that that's still a thing like today with people and going into cults and going into, you know, extreme religions, all kinds of things. People will try to escape, psychologically escape their pain to survive. Okay. And spiritualism is one way to do that. Now it's also possible that, you know, as he's witnessing coming from a Christian background um, and a Roman family, Roman Catholic family, um, he's witnessing all of these practices that in no way align with what he was taught. So his very core of himself is probably rebelling right against these practices and um, going deeper and deeper into what he considers his own like true spirituality. Right. So there's a lot of components here. Um, And also, you know, there's a piece where like, you know, what happened here is also hit or miss for people with him taking the mantle and going uh, back to Ireland with the Christian, with the Christian cleansing, I guess, because for those that are of Catholic persuasion and of Protestant persuasion, they love St. Patrick um, because he's responsible for bringing the word of, of God to the land of the Celts. For those that are not, he's also someone who's responsible for snuffing out or at least attempting to snuff out traditional Irish culture. Okay. And that's important because, um, you know, if you're going from a situation where you have been extremely abused by a group of people and your goal is to take back the opposite belief system to the people that abused you, right? Um, in his mind, I have a lot of compassion for him. I don't, I don't ever agree with wiping out any indigenous cultures and, and Christianizing them. That's not something that I support at all. Everybody should be allowed to do as they will, right? Um, within reason, of course. But it makes sense to me that, um, you know, being surrounded by this very violent group of people that he, that he was subjected into slavery with over a course of seven years, um, it makes sense that he was drawn to, quote unquote, maybe try to snuff that out, maybe as a retaliatory thing somewhere deep inside, but probably also because he really thought he was doing a good thing and was trying not to, um, was trying to like maybe mitigate suffering, right? And of course, you know, the the Celts, were traded in as slaves, right? In the Roman Empire, they were wiped out by the millions. They were killed. So, so there's a whole lot of mixing going on here. And of course, he was, you know, Saint Patrick Sakat was raised in a family that did a lot of the slave trading, and they were officials and they were Roman officials. They witnessed this. So, um, so this kind of mentality, sort of against the Irish, was already sort of instilled in him, right? So then he goes back thinking he's doing this great deed, and he's called by God to go back to Ireland and bring, I guess we'll call it the more tamed, civilized Christian culture. And of course, I'm using that lightly because we also know Christianity is responsible for a great deal of murder and torture throughout history and wiping out of things. Okay. So, but in his mind, he was already predisposed to try and weed out what he deemed as uncivilized and deadly culture. Okay. And really, Honestly, who can blame him? Okay, it's only natural to want to rebel and rail against the people that kidnapped, enslaved, and tortured you. Okay, um, and also probably he recognizes that they were kidnapped, enslaved, and tortured by the Romans. And so, you know, the compassionate piece of him was like, I'm going to bring this belief system instead of and convert them rather than helping with the wipeout. But anyway, so that's basically it for St. Patrick. He did a bunch of stuff and he died and he became a saint. Okay, and he's still venerated today um, around the world. And the last bit of fun history here um, is that St. Patrick's Day came to mean something slightly different in the USA than it does in Ireland. In Ireland, they still commemorate the death of of this saint who brought Christian cr- Christianity and Christian principles to a pagan land, right? They celebrate with a somber dinner um, and some fe- light feasting in church throughout the day. Um, and also the traditional color for St. Patrick's commemoration in Ireland is actually blue. It's not green. Interesting fact. So meanwhile, back in America, where we are dying rivers green and having like street parades with Irish dancing and overflowing Guinness um, on tap everywhere you go, especially in Boston, um, you know, and there's like, there's, it's just like over the top. People are basically, it's kind of like a form of Mardi Gras. Like, I don't know if anybody's ever been to like the, the Boston St. Patty's Day parade, but it is a little bit like Mardi Gras. People are wearing beads, like it's a little cold to be flashing, but sometimes people will be flashing, you know what I'm saying? So um, it happens. But it's 
also um, just kind of a grand old time and nothing like the somber, um, the somber commemorative celebration that happens in Ireland. There's also the advent of the what is now come to be uh, the traditional corned beef and cabbage and potato dinner that comes with St. Patrick's Day. And we'll get back to that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So in the 1700s, and I'm getting, guys, I'm pulling, by the way, I'm sourcing a lot of this from history.com. And also I'm sourcing this from irishcentral.com. Um, and I'm also sourcing this from a couple of other things. Okay. So all this information is available online, just so we're clear. Um, I'm not I'm not skimming that, you know, I'm not like, yeah, I'm taking this from reputable bodies of information and putting it into my podcast. Um, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be like having like a plagiarism sort of thing. So um, just so we're clear. So back in the 1700s, um, a group of about 12 Irish Presbyterian people were brought over to the United States with the colonies and they gathered to commemorate St. Patrick's Day. They also started funds for the struggling Irish immigrants. So, however, there is newer evidence to suggest that the first actual, that that was considered the first, um, the first U.S. based celebration of St. Patrick's Day. Okay. But now there's newer evidence that suggests actually that the first USA based St. Patty's Day celebration may have taken place in St. Augustine in Florida and was hosted by the Spanish. Um, so, there is evidence that we have. Uh, archaeological evidence suggesting that that's the case. So either way, um, Boston still hosts an annual celebration of St. Patrick's Day in the very same church where those um, uh, those 12 Irish people gathered and um, started that tradition there. So the establishment also of the color green as the official St. Patty's Day color actually came from the Redcoats, weirdly enough. Um, in the late 1700s, a group of Irish soldiers wearing green um, who were serving in the British Army, marched down the street to have breakfast at a tavern to commemorate the day, and it kind of stuck. Um, as we jump to the 1800s, many Irish Catholics began to stream into the United States because of the Great Potato Famine, or as they call it, the Great Hunger, um, in which most of the potato crops failed, leaving the Irish starving and impoverished um, because of failed crops. And when they came to the States, they were treated like absolute garbage. They were treated like wild animals. They were seen as basically uh, no better than the servant class. Um, they were put into boxing rings. They were put into whorehouses. They were put into kitchens, like, or they were ignored and they were, they were kind of left to their own devices, right? Okay. So they were basically seen as very, very, like the lowest class. You can get any lower class than the Irish. Okay. And because they weren't home and they were up against so much ignorance and hatred hatred towards them um the now americanized quote-unquote irish they're the irish that were in america now celebrated the day of saint patrick's day not only to commemorate the saint but just generally in favor of in like in honor of being irish right and holding on to their heritage because they didn't have their land anymore but they had their memories and they had their culture um so they celebrated that so that's kind of a, a few other elements got brought into the mix apart from St. Patrick. And there's a reason behind um, certain symbols in the American version of St. Patrick's day, like the leprechaun and the shamrock, right? Because they were very much a part of Irish culture and they kind of got woven into the tapestry. There's no official standpoint on that, but it seems pretty obvious to me. Um, this is also where we see the famed meal of corned beef and cabbage come into play. In Ireland, the traditional meal was actually ham and cabbage, but in the States, the purchase of uh, ham was far too expensive for, for the Irish, so corned beef was the cheaper alternative. They could buy it from the docks off the ships at a penny a pound at the end of the day, and they boiled it three times to get the salt off and the last time with cabbage in order to siphon off um, the rest of the inedibly salty pieces so that the dish then became edible. So that's the history of that dish. Um, once the Civil War came around, the Irish were embraced a lot more warmly because they agreed to fight in the Civil War. Um, so after the war, the the attitude towards the Irish was much different than before the war. So at, And they were finally kind of accepted into American culture, um, at which point everyone started celebrating St. Patrick's Day and honoring the Irish. So it's just kind of snowballed from there. And that's how St. Patrick's, St. Patrick's Day got to be the sort of huge festivity that it is around the country here. Um, 
And speaking of leprechauns, of course, when it comes to Celtic culture in general, we know that basically the traditional heritage of of the Celts was never wiped out. It was it just never was. They're still fighting over which form of Christianity is the best, yet um, all of them still incorporate their traditional heritage on both sides, which includes a strong belief in the fairy or the fae, okay, the realm of the fae, of which the leprechaun is a part. And, you know, basically these beliefs just got integrated into a Christianized landscape, but they still to this day are, have a very strong belief in the fairy, and it comes up in their politics. It comes up in um, day-to-day living, in their farm life, all kinds of things. There was actually, in 2010, there was a, a mandate to cut through a black thorn tree in order to build a throughway, and the construction workers refused because they didn't want to be cursed by the face. So when they took it to court, the judge said, yeah, build around the tree, not through it. We don't want any of that backlash. So that was 2010. So it's still very much a part of the culture, and it's wonderful. Um, so... It's important to understand that the Celts um, were very originally extremely tribal again and basically integrated fully into nature, very shamanistic and very much involved with the nature spirits and the land spirits, otherwise known to them as the fairy. Okay, um, we the, the original story of the fairy kind of harkens back to some things we've touched base on in a couple of other episodes, which is why I want to touch on it. So... Um, the Tua de Danan, or the, the Tua, and I, I know I'm probably butchering that. I don't speak Gaelic. I have a couple words of Gaelic, but I know that their consonants are very much unlike our consonants in pronunciation. So I'm probably screwing that up. So I'm sorry. Um, but the Tua de Danan, also known as the Children of Danae, um, which was an ancient Celtic goddess, kind of shares some remarkable similarities with regards to their origin stories. Um, as the Anunnaki origin stories of the Sumerian tablets. It's actually a little bit startling. So in terms of how leprechauns and the image of the shamrock became and are still heavily associated with St. Patrick, um, who likely shunned all of these traditional lores, right, as evil, there's no hard information out there about this and why it's, um, there's not a specific reason as to why leprechauns are St. Patrick's Day adjacent. However, We know that leprechauns are definitely a carryover from the oldest beliefs in Ireland, okay? From a magical standpoint, it would stand to reason that it's because of the association of luck and gold and prosperity um, and acknowledgement that the old beliefs were, are, and always will be alive and well in the Emerald Isle. Um, But the origin and the etymology of the word leprechaun simply means a small body, and it can be traced back to the 8th century, which is interesting because um, St. Patrick passed away in the 5th century, so that's something to think about as well. Um, and in terms of hard record keeping, you know, we have the Druidic, we have, we, we know the Druids kept records of everything, but, um, in terms of hard record keeping, the, the story of the leprechauns can only be traced back to the eighth century. Oddly, they were originally associated as like a type of water spirit that eventually merged with a household spirit and became, uh, they became like heavy drinkers and they like love whiskey and food. And most spirits in any pantheon, you guys, tend to be really happy about whiskey, rum, wine, coffee, or like cigars. They like to smoke and drink, and they like to be caffeinated. We know this about most pantheons. Um, and that, that goes for the fae as well. And leprechauns are also, according to lore, said to be tricksters. So the other origin of the word leprechaun comes from an old Irish term, uh, lithbrogan, which means, and I know I got that right, um, which means shoemaker. And... Um, You know, and Irish cobblers are, to this day, very good. A pair of Irish shoes will last you an entire lifetime. So, um, and it's funny because the leprechauns love gold, and we're coming back to the Sumerian tablets in a second, but the leprechauns love gold, and nobody nobody really knows why, because unless you're a Jimmy Choo, being a cobbler isn't necessarily a lucrative profession. But here's my theory. If you read through the Sumerian tablet translations, which I am attaching to, um, if you're bored and you feel like being a nerd, go ahead and read it. Um, I'm attaching it to this this podcast. The Anunnaki were also really obsessed with gold, and they valued it as an energy source. And they actually came to Earth, and this is like hundreds of thousands of years old, you guys, like thousands of years old. Um, I'm getting tired now and making up numbers, but it's a it's very old gold tablets we know that they're like you know mesopotamian so we're talking about spacecraft coming to earth in these tablets and mining for gold so that they could use the gold for whatever it was that they used the gold for okay um 
And the leprechauns, their story is that they also mine gold. And if you're looking at that from a perspective of parallels to the Anunnaki, um, it does almost parallel the story of the Fae and the origin of the Fae and how they were driven underground almost parallels exactly the story of the Anunnaki. So it's just very interesting. Um, and given the oral tradition um, of the Fae, it just goes back way before the written. It's just very interesting to think about. So um, I'm personally making that connection. I have no idea if anyone, um, I'm sure somebody out there has also made that connection. It might be worth looking up, but just, you know, we don't actually know what the gold means to the leprechaun legend, but they would mine it from the earth, stick it into a pot and hide it at the end of a rainbow, which as we know, doesn't have a location in the 3D realm. We also know that rainbows are constantly present in multitudes, multitudinous in the sky. Okay, we only see them when uh, the light hits them just right, which is about, about sums up probably the reason for sightings of a lot of different things. Anyway, that concludes our St. Patrick's Day word vomit for our podcast today. And without further ado, I am very excited to invite our fourth guest. Um, our fourth weird guest and artist, the consummate Mr. Jared M. Gordon, to the show. I met Jared 15 years ago, and we actually met on OKCupid, and we've just remained dear friends and artistic comrades ever since. Jared is an accomplished filmmaker and scriptwriter who currently resides in Los Angeles with his lovely wife, Jenny, and their two-and-a-half-year-old son, Asher. And Jared is also a wonderful singer, but don't tell him I told you. Um, he has a number of impressive projects underway, so I am so thrilled to have him on. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Jared M. Gordon. Great. Hi, Jared. All right, everybody, I want to welcome Jared Gordon to the Weirdest Web Podcast Artist Series. Jared is a very dear friend of mine. We met in, what was it, 2008? been a while that sounds about right <laughs> yeah sounds about right um jared is currently a screen and script writer in los angeles california and i wanted to very much welcome him to the show jared thank you for joining us here today thank you so much caitlin it's really good to uh it's good to be here and uh looking forward to our chat yeah, me too. Well, so Jared, tell, I think, you know, people would be really interested to hear what it's like to be a screenwriter in Los Angeles. You're in the thick of it right now. Like, what does that look like for you? How did you start getting involved with screenwriting? Like, just tell us your journey. I want to hear it. I'm gonna drink my coffee while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. Yeah, I, I take mine intravenously through every pain I've got. It's, um, it's a hustle. Um, I would say, um, one of my uh, one of my mentors, um, uh, terrific teacher screenwriter by the name of Tim Alba, he says uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and I think that's the best way to really describe um, not just necessarily a career in screenwriting, but just a career in the arts in the first place. I think so many people kind of hear stories like Sylvester Stallone's and you know Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, like yeah, they moved to Hollywood and. You know, they were eating out of the same takeout container for a month and all of a sudden they were discovered and they made it big. And I think you hear about stories like that for the same reason you hear about plane crashes. Um, it's so unusual and it's so weird when it happens and planes are so ridiculously safe that like when all of a sudden you hear about one malfunctioning, you're just like, whoa, that's that's kind of strange. Um, far more common from what I've noticed are stories of people who just kind of keep their heads down and write and write and write and, and work and work on the on the order of decades um, and that's typically it, it, that, that's when lightning strikes but it takes a very long time uh, Peter Craig screenwriter who uh, co-wrote um, like the Batman he did uh, I think Catching Fire and Mockingjay um, he says, you know, people are, you know, waiting to be struck by lightning out here, but, you know, not enough people are working on making themselves available for lightning to strike them. And I think that's a good way to think about it. You need to spend more time really just kind of putting your best foot forward, networking, 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 getting content out there, writing content as much as you possibly can, research, meet people, and... um everything but it's about like really kind of incrementally upping your odds you know with everything that you do and someday i mean maybe like once every few years you take a big step forward and then it's just a bunch of baby steps you know for another couple of years and 
you know, students that I've taught, I say to them, you know, don't go out there expecting to be discovered, just go out there just expecting to work very, very hard. And, you know, you can't guarantee that, that, that it'll happen for you. But, you know, there are things you can do to max that or in your power to maximize your chances. And um, for me, it just came down to there was, there was nothing that made me happier than just telling a story and coming up with my own ideas and putting them down. And um, my father was, um, would give me like the family video camera, you know, when I was growing up and, you know, I had, you know, action figures and Play-Doh and micro machines and I would make movies. My mother would read to me every night. And so I think in that kind of, in that you know, kind of, I guess sort of a sort of a creative incubator, um, you know, I'm an only child. I don't have brothers and sisters. And so it was just me and the action figures, you know, who are partying down. And so um, I just started putting stories together and then more of them and more of them. And I just, uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, so um, I would watch movies and wonder, you know, how do I get my name in the credits? You know, how does that, how do I do that? And there's just nothing like working on a film, making one. And, you know, as someone who, I mean, primarily working on writing them nowadays, but as someone who's made, you know, a fair number, it's, um, it's great to be able to like some months or a year or so after you come up with an idea to be able to sit a bunch of people in a, in a room and say, all right, this was in my imagination. Now you get to see it. And so that's, that's why I do it. And that's why I want to continue doing it. That's, and, and you're one of those people, I think where, you know, that hard work that you've been putting in for so long is starting to really show some results. You've got a couple scripts being optioned and you've got a couple things in the works there. Do you want to talk about that? For a minute sure yeah yeah i um you know after getting used to a bunch of scripts down and so forth i wanted to you know find a manager uh and so forth um and i've signed with uh with a couple since i've been out here and um the one i'm with now he's um he's a friend from uh who i've known for a while and he's um he's great and uh, we're getting you know putting meetings together and, and pitch decks and so forth um but yeah i mean we're just uh working on projects sending them out there seeing what's um you know seeing what uh, the market responds to um he um he got the rights to uh to an architect in the seattle tacoma area who was in the news last year about um he had uh, moved into his cubicle uh to try and stave on rent and he put up uh he kind of blogged about he on, on tiktok and so forth and he's very very chill he's very very funny this guy he's he's quite a character and, and just really engaging and very charming and um the yeah, two or three days after um he started tiktoking his experience living in his cubicle uh his company fired him and it's just kind of it, it's you know it was in newsweek and it was in a couple other outlets just like it's there's a national conversation on well, you know, why couldn't they have had a conversation with him? Why couldn't they, there have been like a discussion about, well, I don't think I'm being you know, paid enough for the work I'm doing and so forth, but instead they just fired him. So um, I um, wrote the script uh, comedy, you know, based on that story. And so we're shopping that around. I also just um, optioned a, a really just amazing uh, video game that I can't talk about just yet, but it's, um, it's a great, it's a, it's a beautiful, amazing, incredible story. And so we're, uh, working on um, kind of shopping that around as like a live action adaptation uh, okay. and so forth. And, uh, and also just, you know, working on right now, like a female driven kind of near future uh, sort of comedy about, um, you know, what, what would happen if you could launch, uh, you know, an ex or, you know, a, a, a nosy family member or a mean boss, what happens if there's a service that can launch people into space for you and so <laughs> forth. And so there's this couple, who they have this bad breakup and uh, the main character, she uh, pays the company to launch her ex into space, not knowing that her ex is paid for the same thing. So they're both launched into space <laughs> and it's meant to be a temporary thing, just like 20 minutes up and down, just to like scare them and teach them a lesson. But there's a malfunction on the rocket and both of them have to work together and uh, kind of get along uh, in order to save each other and get back down to earth. So I'm just kind of putting the finishing touches on that right now. And, um, Hopefully we'll be sending that around shortly. And, uh, but yeah, it's just Amazing. about kind of figuring out, you know, content and going through the, um, just going through the process and just seeing what, uh, what works, but it's always just like, all right, well, what's next? I mean, it's not just about, you know, like, okay, now I have a manager. Now it's easy street. Okay. I've sold a script. Now it's easy street. Okay. It's just, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a constant hustle. And one thing that I wish my film program taught me was, um, 
how to do that <laughs> and so forth and just like the value of networking and so forth it's just it can't be understated how important the tenacity to just like keep on people and make those phone calls and make those connections and keep at it over and over and over again how important that is um as important as i mean if you want to make a living in the industry it's as important a skill as knowing the you know story structure and so forth networking, and character you mean development networking yeah networking is, yeah. and just yeah it's just uh it's a skill and it's um it can be very hard to do and it can be discouraging when you know you reach out to sometimes dozens of people and you know one of them or none of them get back to you and so forth and it's it's hard to not be discouraged um on that and it's um you know it's important to never take rejection personally uh in this in this industry it's free for them to say no i mean if you pitch like a dozen production companies and they all say no they haven't risked anything but you know for them to say yes to get them to any producer to say yes to a project this that means years of their life you know that means like t- any film that gets made you know takes years and the budgeting and just like hiring people and it's a colossal effort so to get a yes it's um, it's not so simple you know and you hear about stories all the time about like oh they you know that production company passed on you know that developing that film and now it's a multi-billion dollar franchise you know because it's just it's cheaper to say no and it's less risky to say no you know if you're in the point of view of a producer um and not every film not every property does well and so you know i think i think you know from their perspective you know they're right to be choosy you know they have to be you know their career their livelihoods their lives depend on it and so forth so um but yeah, it's just it's a hustle for everybody, and but it's it's a good skill to learn. Definitely, and now you you talked about um, you know the films that you've made in the past. I know you have your own production company, Winter Twilight Productions. Can you talk about that mm-hmm. for a little bit? Yeah, happy to. Uh, started it back in I want to say two thousand three or so, and it was pretty much right after I finished undergrad and. I had a camera, I had editing equipment, I had everything I needed, and I had, you know, friends who, and family who expressed a willingness to act, and, uh, and um, I just jumped right into it, you know, by and large, and I kind of taught myself how to use the equipment, how to, you know, use, like, the editing software, I just taught myself as I went along, and um, I just said, well, I have, you know, I was, you know, in suburban New York at the time, and I said, well, I have access to these locations, to these people, and so surely I can crank out a story for, you know, a little bit, and so there was a time from 2003 to 2006, each of those summers, I would make a very, very low-budget um, independent feature film, and they all kind of ran the gamut, you know, of, uh, I was still trying to figure out what, you um, what my voice was, what my tone was. The first one was a mockumentary. The second was a romantic comedy. The third one was this kind of family drama. The third one was a total absurdist comedy and, um, and so forth. And, you know, since then, uh, mostly kind of focusing on uh, short films uh, and so forth. Uh, the features were fun to, to put together. It took a lot of time, but I also wanted to increase the production value of every film that I subsequently made and uh, working with a limited budget. I just uh, we just wanted to really focus on telling you know some shorter, tighter stories, mm. uh, and so forth from there. So, um, but yeah, what's most your of favorite, them are available. What's your favorite genre that you like? What's your favorite genre to delve into? Uh, nowadays, I'm really kind of focusing on um, female driven, usually like near future kind of female driven, um, like five minutes and kind of like um, like Black Mirror esque, I think. Uh, but also, but I think a bit more lighthearted um, than that. Uh, so the ones that I've been going out with have been, um, you know, primarily comedies, but female driven, but also has to do with some sort of like near future tech um, and so forth. So kind of a little speculative um, and, and so on. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that those are the ones that I really kind of gravitate towards um, by and large. Um, but yeah, I mean, my last, uh, the last, you know, several films that I made, the short that I made were, uh, you know, were female driven films and uh, just characters who were, dealing with something at the crisis point of their lives and um, figuring out how to just kind of grow as people, you know, ultimately. Um, so I'd, I'd love to go back to filmmaking at some point, but uh, pretty much just kind of putting my head down and focusing primarily just on uh, writing nowadays and just working on getting my scripts out there. And if someone else wants to um, pick them up or direct them, then um, then that's fine. Uh, that's, I mean, that's you know what I'm doing right now. So yeah. Um, yeah, but it's um it's fun, and either way, I get to you know I get to tell some really great stories and meet some really great people. So that's 
That's why I do it. What inspires you? Like when you sit down to write a script, what do you draw from? Is it life experience or just your own sort of like in your own internal stimuli? Like what, what lights you up when you're, you know, what are those moments where you're like, Oh, I need to write a script about that. Like, um, I think it's primarily it's, it's uh, sometimes I come up with the with like the, the kind of idea first. Like I wrote a um, I wrote a, a pilot script uh, that was out um, on a shopping agreement not long ago about uh, a young woman who inherits a company that has created these uh, kind of very tiny personal sized engines that are capable of light speed travel. Think of it like an air tag, and you can basically attach it to anything and. It could basically, if, if you want to send a package to, you know, New Delhi, it'll be there in a second. But it also works on living things and people, and it, and it gets them there safely. So you could like put it in your pocket, and bip, all of a sudden you could be in New Delhi in like a second, and so forth. So she inherits this company that creates these um, kind of just like light speed engines and so forth. And uh, she makes at the end of the pilot episode, she makes it open source so that everybody can basically create one of these things. Uh, and so forth. So, um, I like thinking of like kind of conceptual tech and how to like take what we have today and just kind of think five minutes into the future as to, I mean, something like that would be probably more like at least 20 minutes into the future, but the whole idea basically being just kind of taking this, this idea and developing it into a story, but also trying to figure out like, who are the last characters in the world who should have access to this tech? You know, who are the last ones who, who are the ones who would use it the most irresponsibly? And those are usually the most fun ones to write about. And so we're the scripts that, you know, going out with now about, um, you know, with the couple kind of launching each other into space. Um, you know, I'm just like, it's just, of course, you know, like people are going to use it for petty revengey reasons and so forth. It's, I mean, when, when going into space used to be this great grand one, you know, one small step you know one giant leap kind of endeavor and now it's just like becoming like this like petty kind of like you know revenge you know fest kind of thing and, and so <laughs> forth and so um i kind of want to celebrate that pettiness <laughs> in its own way and um but i mean that's, that's i also i don't want to i also don't want to i don't want to point fingers and say like oh look at i don't want to make it cynical and make it oh look at how you know, we have access to this, all this, these amazing things that we're using them for these like personal reasons. I mean, of course we are. I don't want to really kind of point that as point that into being like, like, like necessarily a bad thing, but I also want to show how we can use this as an opportunity for growth and so forth and how to heal broken relationships. Um, Cause I mean, every good story is about the healing of a, some sort of broken relationship or the healing of some sort of um something is broken and so major fracture um, yeah 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 like you know finding nemo is all about you know it's a father-son relationship that's broken and needs to be you know reassembled and so that's i mean my inspiration it's always like character driven and so forth and what's the relationship what's the core story who are the characters um who is hurt here who is troubled who winds up in big trouble and what is the relationship that, you know, on the backdrop of a rocket ship or a light speed engine or time travel, you know, whatever it is, what is it that really needs fixing here internally? And regardless, I mean, the technology is you know part of it, but the technology is also kind of, it, it's a metaphor for what really needs to be worked on in this relationship. So, I mean, I'm always, I'm a, I, mean, I love, you know, Pixar films, Miyazaki films that really just have these sometimes fantastical, really imaginative sort of settings, but these are very human, very flawed characters who just need to be better ultimately. And that's, that's really what I focus on is, you know, how does a character grow? What do they learn about themselves and pursuing what they really desire? How does that make them ironically into a better person? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And so it kind of sounds like you can, your, your ilk is to kind of combine sort of like a, sci-fi realism with meets human drama like kind of sort of with that's not about accurate i don't know <laughs> yeah no no I, I think i think that's right and it's just um yeah how it comes to i just kind of like sit and i brainstorm and it's just like you know what are some technologies you know today it's like a, a film like her you know like the spike jones you know film about mm -hmm. you know like joaquin phoenix kind of falls you know in love with his like siri or his personal assistant and so i mean that's 
something like that is 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 my target audience you know gotcha. i would say it's just it's it's clever it's like a just i mean it was made in 2013 so now and now the, you, there are people who have like virtual boyfriends and girlfriends and so forth with, with chat bots and it's just because of course they do and so it's um but like what does that relate like what does that tell us about the person who would prefer a virtual partner over a real partner like what is that you know it, it's what is that telling us? What is that showing us about human nature? You know, what are the relationships in their lives that have convinced them that this is the best relationship for them and so forth. Sure. And that's, that those are the things that I want to take a look at and, and try and learn from myself um, and so forth. Um, but yeah. I mean, it's also, you know, also blend in, you know, plenty of personal experience and so forth. And this is what I've experienced and seen and it's um so yeah it's kind of a marriage of trying to make it like a the universal and the personal um and so forth in the process of telling the story how long does it take you to when from start to finish when you are crafting a script what does that process look like and how long how long would you say it, on average it takes you i'm sure they all have their different timelines depending on the type of script and how how long you have for deadlines etc but on the whole, what would you say that, what does that process look like for you? I would say comfortably I can get out maybe on average, um, maybe two or three, like if it's like a feature script, if it's like doing, if I'm doing features, maybe like two or three a year, you know, perhaps on average. Okay. Um, you know, the latest one, the one I'm working on now is maybe taking a bit longer than average just because there were certain parts where I was like, I was really stuck and trying to figure out, well, okay, well, where does it go from here? What makes the most sense? What's the best path for this character to take that the audience won't expect, but that'll also be, you know, within the, make perfect sense regarding who this character is and so forth. Uh, sometimes I get like really, really excited about a script and it's just like, I think um, the one based on uh, the fellow who is living in his cubicle, um, that one, yeah, you know, I usually, I, mean, I write, uh, I always write a treatment first, like a, uh, like a, just like a, you know, prose description of the plot, usually like two to 10 pages or so. And I usually just kind of refer to that and that can change, you know, as the story goes on, but um, that helps to kind of streamline the process. And then I know, you know, some screenwriters use index cards and so forth. And I've tried that in the past. And uh, there's a lot of great, you know, possibilities out there when it comes to plotting out story but that one i uh, i mean the first draft of that i had done very very quickly i was really excited about the story i knew exactly where it was going and uh, that i mean that was a first draft though i mean something i mean to, the edits and rewrites took longer than that um so yeah i would say it depends usually like it could i mean th that took less i think like less than a month to write you know the 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 first draft of that, the first draft of the one I'm working on on now, took consider took took months just because it's uh, I just hit a few points where I was really trying to figure out like where is this going, they're up in space now what, and so I didn't want it to just be, all right, they launched each other into space that's funny and now what's going to happen here so I wanted to kind of I needed to come up with ideas to keep the momentum going to keep the excitement high and, and not just high but not just keep it high but but build it and so forth so it can take a while and just kind of try to figure out like what fits the best you know for what the characters need and you know what you know to kind of defy audience expectations but still do it in a way that makes perfect sense regarding who the characters are and what they would do um so yeah i don't i don't rush myself um sometimes it just spills out very quickly and other times it uh it takes a little while but uh, yeah on average i would say you know, i can usually get you know a couple scripts done in a year i would say at least vaguely reliably but it depends on the story and um where it goes from there but um yeah i'm sure i'll my manager's gonna ask me once this one is done all right what's next and i uh i actually i have no idea what's next <laughs> at this point so well I'll now to, you're um, also a full-time parent to a little toddler asher Yes. Um, a cutie little pants and you're a full-time husband and you also work as a professor so how does this kind of work integrate into that kind of a tapestry in your life like that must be you split in four directions constantly <laughs> <laughs> there's um a great man scotty from star trek once said if something is that <laughs> important to you if something's that important to you you make the time and i think that's accurate um you know i mean uh, my wife and i you know share you know you know, you know parenting you know duties and so forth you know i mean she you know, works from um she works from home and um 
you know, I'm, you know, in and out of the classroom. I teach kind of like a hybrid sort of some classes are online and some are in person and so forth. And, um, we just, um, I mean, we're, we just support each other, find a way to make it work, uh, and so forth. And, uh, you know, carving out time to write, you know, is an absolute, you know, it's, I mean, like taking care of Asher is my top priority and, uh, writing is, um, is, um, is, is, is a priority, you know, as well. And so, it's just a matter of finding the time and really carving it out and um, and sticking to it and just um, supporting each other. Like, hey, you know, I'll take you know these two hours to write, and then you know, in two hours from now, I'll keep an eye on him and so forth. And so, it's um, it becomes pretty frictionless, you know. After a while, um, every semester the, the teaching schedule changes, and so it's um, sometimes I'm teaching in the mornings, sometimes in the afternoons, and so forth. And you know, Asher's. Uh, you know, just like keeping an eye on him, and he's in, um, you know, he's in, uh, he's in like a childcare part time, and so um, that's helpful. But it's also just a matter of kind of fitting in, like, all right, well, who's going to pick him up? Who's going to drop him off, and so forth. And so it's uh, it always works out, but it just kind of takes a little bit of think. It's, it's it's almost like working on a script, you know, and like all these pieces, and you know, they have to interlock together somehow. Um, but it's just a matter of kind of figuring out how to join them all together. So in a weird sort of way, it's uh, it, it, it's kind of like uh, you know figuring out the schedule is 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 a logic puzzle not unlike writing, you know I would say. Yeah. And so it's almost kind of micro or macrocosmic in that uh, in that sense. Um, you make the time, you make it work, and it's just you know mutual respect and just kind of you know keeping a dialogue going. Like hey, you know this week, you know, can I take a bit more time to, cause I'm really, you know, behind on this or, Hey, can, you know, like, let's, you know, we need to fix this. We did. So it's just, um, it's like contract it's, negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's always, you know, very friendly. And yeah, I mean, the, everyone's goal is the same, you know, make sure that, you know, Ash is, uh, you know, just that he has eyes on him at all times and, you know, just keep him engaged and so forth, you know, like taking him out on walks. We like taking him on trips and so forth. And, um, yeah, just you know, and making sure that he you know is 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 happy and having a good time and so forth. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we make it interlock, we make it work, and it. Um, one thing I guess that's nice about having the uh, the academic schedule, and yeah, even though it, it changes every semester, um, it's not a nine to five. So if it was, that would probably make things a bit more difficult. If it was kind of just really kind of set full hours every day, because then. You know, I would be you know indisposed, you know, completely indisposed during that time. But as it stands now, we make it's just like certain days of the week where I could take him on longer, or you know, I could take him on longer, and so forth. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, we we make it work, and it's it. We we also know it's good for morale when we get stuff done. Like when I'm coming off of you know writing for you know three or four hours, I feel great. You know, thinking, wow, I really got a lot done today. And you know, when you know Jenny is able to. You know, get you know her work done. You know it's 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 good for her. So it's good for everybody. You know when we all kind of help each other succeed and so forth. And I think that's uh, that's really the crux of it right there. And I think that's the lens through which we view it. That sounds extremely functional. Congratulations. <laughs> Sounds like a functional family dynamic. Yay! We we we, we, we yeah we we stu- it's we 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 drunkenly stumbled into it <laughs> through the uh, into 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 a vague functionality. So it's uh it's like um what is it like like a like a tornado blowing through a junkyard and somehow creating a functional seven forty seven or something like that. It's just uh, not not that we're anywhere near as functional as a seven forty seven, but it's um I mean we, we, it works because it has to. I mean we have to find a way to just kind of make it work but it's just keeping an eye on like what our core priorities are asher and you know and 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 work and so forth and uh we just um you know there's we it just has to work you know somehow there's no other option so we just we make it work however we can and do you ever i bet you make up bedtime stories for asher all the time he's a lucky (laughs) kiddo Uh, he's, uh, it's kind of you to say he's, he's a fun, yeah, we do, we do a lot of reading. Like I said, you know, my mother read to me every night growing up and that's, it's very important to us that, you know, the same, you know, for him and so forth. So he, um, I do, you know, I, I, we read, you know, plenty of books and I do all the voices of all the characters and, and so forth. And, uh, yeah, when we're outside, um, you know, I make up games and so forth, like, uh, like uh, oh, there's Cheerios on the other side of the street. Let's cross the street, oh, street quest kind of thing. And so I try to make, 
try to make the mundane exciting. Uh, you know, but that goes a long way. I think my parents were really good about that too. They always read to me, um, you know, from, from classics, from new things into the voices and, and in terms of nurturing creativity and intellectual curiosity and all of those things, there is, I feel like that's such a critical potentially missing piece right now for some kids, right? Like just, the act of sitting and reading your child a bedtime story is sort of a fundamental uh some groundwork in creative in creativity and creative nurturing so i i love that i love that because it definitely was for my childhood as well um and look sure how you turned out thank you well i yeah. don't know if that's a thank you i don't know maybe maybe it's okay <laughs> <laughs> meant as a compliment thank you i appreciate that um and I was going to ask you, like, I bet your parents are pretty proud of, of your path as well, seeing as how they, seeing as how they were fundamental in establishing, establishing that with you. Oh, I hope so. Um, they, I mean, they're, they're always very curious about, you know, what I'm, uh, what I'm doing and you know, what are you working on? What are you writing? How's that going? You know, who are you meeting and so forth? And uh, yeah, so it's just, um, you know, I'm 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 grateful to them for uh, you know what uh, you know, for you know dad trusting me with a family video camera and uh, <laughs> and so forth when I was in single digits because I could have I could have gone very very poorly uh, and um, and yeah and, and you know it's a you know it's a mom too you know for you know reading and so forth and uh, and effort for for sitting through all like the little plays that I did with all my action figures and everything they didn't have to do that <laughs> but they they did. They did all the weird stories that I would come up with with my Robin Hood and Jurassic Park action figures and everything, and um, they sat through everything. So that was um, that, that. That was uh, the fact they did that was and has been noted. And um, yeah, they just uh, you know, encouraging. Uh, so that's been uh, so that's been great. And um, but yeah, it's just a matter of um, just kind of keeping my head down and just staying focused. And all right, well. I'm happy with the things I've done, but I, I know that I need to keep going and I need to, you know, what's the next step? Okay. Now that I've done this, this is something I've always wanted. Great. So now pivot and what's the next mountain to climb? Because it's never just, you know, I mean, even friends of mine who get staffed on TV shows and so forth, or who've written a script, you know, that, that gets, uh, that gets sold and, and made the big question is, okay, great. That could support you for maybe a year. And then what, you know, then what are you going to do? And so, it's it's just a constant hustle, you know, out here and just feeding off of that and being in that environment and so forth. Um, it's inspiring. It's like going to uh, the Austin Film Festival, uh, especially as a writer. You, know, you go there and you meet, I mean, the best people you can meet are not even necessarily the panelists. It's the other writers who are there. Oh, yeah. And just being around, you know, it. I mean, it's just being around that energy and just trading business cards with them. And what are you working on? What are you working on? Oh, it's cool. I'd love to read it. Let's trade reads. Kind of, it's just a whole bunch of writer nerds, you know, getting together at the Driscoll Bar and just having um, having a blast. And it's um, it's uh, it's just great, you know, to just be in um, – because then people think of writing especially as a solitary activity. And – it's um, you can make so many, you can meet so many great people, and it's just such terrific networking and folks who can help your career, and you can help theirs, you know, across the board. You know, believe in each other and just you know help each other out. So, uh, yeah, it's just uh, finding your people and finding your tribe and and kind of just supporting each other. You know, whether it's you know family like parents or whether it's other writer nerds you meet at Austin or you know any kind of industry you know mixer or whatever it is it's just uh it's important to we're all in it together and no one's really going into the arts alone um i mean you can if you want to but it's no it's you fun can't to find. <laughs> you really can't <laughs> i guess you've you got can. a network yeah. yeah you've got a network i mean you can have the most amazing things but if nobody sees them and they're just sitting in your basement like what is that accomplishing right like nothing um, that's what nothing at all um, I feel like I'm very curious to hear, like, what is it like to um, to sit in a meeting with your script and have it gone over by a panel of people? Like, what is that like? Uh, I had a meeting, I think, back in January for um, this one uh, project that we're going out with and so forth. And um, I mean, you need to think it's 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 about the project, but it's also very much about you. And, you know, there's they're kind of like in a general meeting, as an example, Um 
it may not, I mean, they'll ask you questions about, you know, what you're working on and so forth, but they're also, they're mainly asking you questions to see if you're someone who they might want to work with at some point. And so I find it to be, I mean, some people, I think my, my, maybe when you first get started finding it a bit nerve wracking uh, and so forth, but it's, uh, it, it's a meeting where you're expected to be yourself. I think as maybe as cliche as that sounds, you're not expected to do a sales pitch. In, and in fact, you know, these are, sometimes very jaded people who you're talking to. And so they're used to being pitched to, and they know when they're being pitched to, and it turns them off. Yeah. And so I think they're just looking for someone genuine and to understand like what your connection is to the material that you're, that, that you're working on, that, that, you know, what is it that excites you? It's, it won't, I mean, it, it can be, I guess, nerve wracking, but for me, I, I find it very easy just because if, 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 if there's one thing I'm, I'm, I'm good at, I, I think it's just kind of being myself, you know, I just kind of, and just kind of acting as, as I am. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I find it to be exciting and I just kind of love feeding off of that excitement and just, you know, explaining to them, this is why I'm passionate about what I'm doing. And this is, you know, this is what attracted me to the material in the first place. And you know, just being honest and open about that and so forth. And so it's, um, yeah, I mean, if it's a good rapport, if it's exciting, and then you kind of feed off of each other, you know, and, and, and so forth. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's also important to research, you know, anyone who you're talking to ahead of time, you know, more than just IMDb, but, you know, read about them in the trades and Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, um, you know, just see what they've been working on, see what deals have been signed lately, you know, just, you know, be be up to date on things so that you can refer to it and say, hey, I saw that recently you, you know, you signed blah 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 or you recently you know greenlit this and that's really me you know like that's man if i were working on that here would be some of my ideas for that yeah you know, just i don't know i think there's just a way to kind of have some genuine rapport and make it seem as though you're interested in them and the best way to do that is to be actually interested in them and so forth and uh, just keep it a conversation um back and forth i remember when i was applying to schools as an undergrad everyone said everyone is um it's a career counselor or college counselor i spoke to said everyone is concerned with being good enough for the college they're applying to, but too few people are applying as if like these, pla I mean, these places are vying for your attention too. you know, these places are kind of applying to you, you know, and as, and you're applying to them, but they're also applying to you, you know, to see if, you know, and, and they want you to pick them, you know, some of these places, you know, and so they're kind of evaluating it like that. It kind of just puts a different perspective on things. Um, so I find it exciting and I think it's just fun to be in a room with people. It just, I just, it's just, they want to talk story. They want to talk character. And these are things that I just can't shut up about. And so I just, I look forward to it. And I think it's always a fun opportunity to just be in a room with people who they all want the same thing. You know, everybody there wants the same thing. They want a story that they feel they can market or a writer that they feel they can work with. And, you know, we're, our, everyone's goals are the same, you know, ultimately. And so it pays to just be yourself and to, just jump into it with both feet. Love that. And we're running out of time, Jared, but I just have one more question for you that I ask mm -hmm. everybody that sits with me. Um, what is your definition of art? I think it's blending the universal with the personal. I think it's uh, taking, putting your own personal stamp on something that everyone can relate to. Um, Andrew Stanton talks about this when during his TED talk when he talks about finding Nemo. And um, we've all had relationships with a parent or a guardian, and we all can relate to kind of having that sort of relationship with someone that's universal. And that's in, you know, in finding Nemo, it's a father son relationship. You know, Andrew Stanton, you know, talks about in, in his talk, he says, you know, that he was uh, born premature, that when, when, you know, he was, he was in the hospital as a baby for months, he wasn't expected to live. And, um, he, of course he made it. And then, you know, of course he went on to do amazing you know, things and tell amazing stories. But, and that I think kind of informs my watching of finding Nemo because Nemo not expected to live, you know, like born under terrible circumstance. And so you're just like, huh, I didn't even realize I was watching Andrew Stanton's own story when I was watching this film. Yeah. And so that's that, and, and it went on to become, I think, for for a while, like it still might be the top selling DVD of all time. So that just represents the power of a good story, taking the universal. Everyone has had, you know, a parent child relationship, and making and and also but blending it 
with the personal in a way that he did. You know, it is kind of in many ways his own. So George Lucas did the same thing with Star Wars. That's also a father quest. You know, I mean, Finding Nemo is kind of a reverse, you know, sort of father quest. But it's um, in Star Wars, you know, Luke is uh, is told, you know, go and follow your father, but do not repeat his mistakes, you know, ultimately. And that's something that we're all challenged to do. But, I mean, George Lucas, you know, he had a, you know, pretty famously, he didn't have the best relationship with his father. You know, his father, I think, worked at Xerox, and, you know, they didn't, you know, necessarily get along very well. And so that informs my watching of Star Wars, because I'm just like, oh, you know, of course this was written by George Lucas. It's about a guy who doesn't get along with his dad. And, um, but it's also a story very much about are we going to repeat the mistakes of our own forebears and our own parents and so forth. And so I think it's the universal is something to which everyone can relate, but artists, I think, take their own personal experience and kind of filter it through themselves. And that's why you get. Yeah. It's like everyone's familiar with, you know, flowers and so forth but you know Vin only vincent van gogh saw them in the way that he did you know picasso pollock i mean these are you know artists who just you know took things that people were familiar with and just interpreted them through themselves through their own experience the way they saw the world and just interpreted them in their own way and i think that's the case with painters with poets you know with novelists with anyone who just creates you know period you know directors editors it's just taking part of themselves and putting it into something to which everyone can relate um and that's what you know when i say blending the personal with the universal um i think that's what artists do i mean art inevitably is personal i think and i mean we're attracted to it because of the voice of the artist but we're also attracted to it because it's something we can relate to and recognize ourselves um so you know that's something that i you know, encourage my students to aspire towards and that's certainly without a doubt what i aspire towards also and so in a nutshell i would see that that, that would be where i would even begin to define uh such a tremendous concept it is it's a massive concept and i that's why i love getting everybody's perspective on it because the definitions are all you know so personally filtered and um and so also very equally meaningful um do you take on private students, Jared? If somebody wanted to contact you for some script writing advice, would that be something you would take on or is that too much right now? Yeah, no, I do. I have a, um, I have a website where I, uh, I haven't been actively promoting it lately just because I've been so busy with my own work, but uh, screenplay.guru is, uh, is um, where people can hop onto. And if, you know, they want to, you know, chat about an idea that they have for a script or story or something like that, I'm more than happy to, uh, to hop on a call and, um, you know, my own creative work and what I've been working on, I put up on my website at, uh, jaredmgordon.net. All of these and, things will um, be linked you guys. So you can, you can have access to these websites. We're going to link all of these below, including Jared's, uh, winter twilight production work. And so you can see exactly what he's doing. Ooh, I might get three or four <laughs> views this month. Excellent. Woohoo! I know <laughs> getting those online views is so funny. Like it's a funny thing. But I mean, I certainly, um, you know, I've always appreciated your work. I think you're one of the more thoughtful artists that I have had the pleasure. All of the artists that have been on here are incredibly thoughtful people, but I appreciate the way that you sort of slowly evaluate what you're doing and the pace at which you like put yourself through. I know you say some of your work is quick, but also it's very obvious in your work that you put a lot of thought and deliberate, like deliberate time behind everything. You guys, this man also calls me every year on my birthday to sing me a song on my birthday. Like that is how thoughtful he is. Like it's there in his calendar planned out. And he has a beautiful singing voice, by the way. Um, so, so this is the type of thoughtfulness that goes into your work as well. And it's just very- Only obvious. you, nobody else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's appreciate it's appreciated because I honestly feel like a lot of the times when you're watching a movie of any caliber past a certain time period, right? Like there's a whole subsect of movies that obviously has not had any thought put into it beyond like this, there's an explosion here and there's like some random storyline here and characters that don't make sense that you don't care about here. And I would like to see the opposite start to come back into the fold where we have thought out storylines and meaningful characters and meaningful things that impact people in a way that's not necessarily with violence and sadness and, you know, crushing, crushing scenarios. And those are also important, but there's also a lot of that happening. So I, 
I wanted to say from that standpoint, I really appreciate the work that you do. And I look forward to your work being more public and being made more available for public consumption. Thanks. And back at you. Yeah. So, uh, so say we all, and, uh, you know, and, and your work is, um, as well, you know, as a performer, as a writer, um, I hope you're also able to make the time to really refine it and get it out there because it, um, it absolutely should be seen and heard. Thank you. You just made me almost cry. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Me too. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Jared, thank you so yeah. much for coming on and yeah, sharing with our weirdlings. And I hope we get to um, chat more soon. It's been really lovely. Are you still there? Yeah, it's been it's been great. Thank you so much for making the time. And uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just had a little weirdness. You know, that that Appalachia okay, yeah. adjacent basement yeah. internet is <laughs> <laughs> springs up every once in a while. I understand the lake effect. It it affects uh, it affects us all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's it's been great. Thank you so much for making the time. And um, yeah, just keep uh, will keep me posted on what uh, what you're working on, of course. And um, yeah, looking forward to our next chat. Same here. Yeah, I'll send you that script uh, pretty soon. But thank you so much, Jared. It's been an absolute Please. pleasure. Jared M. Gordon, everybody, and you can find the links to his work below. I hope everyone enjoyed that interview. I know that I did. Um, so we're going to wrap things up. We know that we have our golden dewdrop, but for today's golden dewdrop, um, we're doing something just a little bit different here. I'm going to turn off my fan. I just realized it's making a lot of noise. All right, there we go. Um, generally, you know, I love to read something aloud, but I couldn't find the text to this story. So I'm going to link it below, at least on the YouTube. For those of you listening on Spotify, um, this is an adorable fairy tale. Actually, for everybody listening, this is an adorable fairy tale that is literally the exact same recording I've been listening to since I was like seven years old. It's called The Scarlet Braces. I have no idea who wrote it. It was on a storyteller series that I loved very much growing up. And I found it on YouTube and it is about a boy who finds a leprechaun and what happens. So I hope you guys enjoy that. I'm posting it below. And again, for those of you listening, it's called the Scarlet Braces by the Storyteller Compilation. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody today for joining me on the Weirdest Web podcast, a podcast dedicated to showcasing hidden artistic gems and highlighting the magical world of artistic expression as a channel of spirituality and mysticism. If you wish to interview as an artist, you can please email me at theweirdestweb at yahoo.com, and you can type weird artist in the subject line. If you want to submit a question to our Ask a Priestess 2.0, you can also email me at the same email and just put weird question in the subject line. And you can check out my links to my music and my Etsy shop below, and make sure you tune in next week when we're going to host our fifth fabulous guest, Miss Kali Dossi Burgess. Um, that may also be coming out by next week. I mean, like in a few days, because we're doing our interview on Monday. So it should be out soon, you guys. Um, also stay tuned for our next Ask a Priestess podcast coming up as well, along with another Weirdest Grimoire magic lesson. And I will also be introducing everybody to the fourth and final thread that we'll be weaving into our Weirdest Web. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. I am your weird host and resident high priestess. Caitlin Mora Walter, thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, keep it weird, guys.